All right, our next presenter is Mark, and he leads the rights game info security team here in Europe. He already has a history with Brucom, and today Mark is going to talk about his experience with Riot Games itself. So let's give him a warm welcome and hear it from Mark. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. Can everyone hear okay? Cool. Um, thanks very much for staying, although I guess some of you are actually staying for the dinner rather than the presentation, but uh, you know, hopefully you enjoy it and hopefully no one's as nervous as I am because I'm actually shitting it at the minute. Okay, cool. So um, I work for Riot Games and this presentation is really about building a security program um, from scratch, which is two and a half years ago. Um, I joined Riot in May 2013, and this kind of talks about the challenges that I faced, or sorry, that we faced as a team. Um, talks about some of the incidents, talks about what we did with those incidents, and then really how we leveled up our security program, and then we move it on to some of the features and things that we want to do. Um, and then at the end, we'll do a Q&A. So if you have any questions, can you keep them to the Q&A? And I'll try to answer everything I can. Otherwise, if it has to go one-on-one -on -one afterwards, just please approach me. And if you play the game, uh, I have some skin cards left. A couple of people came up, and I was like, okay, do you want a skin card? And they're like, yeah. And then it's like, do you have any friends? And they're like, yeah, one. So like every gamer seems to have one friend, so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but hey. <clears throat> hey, Chris, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. This is the agenda, pretty much as I said. A little bit more of an introduction now. So this basically shows some of the things that I can do. Also shows that I can operate a JSON validator on the internet. Um, it's actually trickier than it looks, but that's what happens when you move more into leadership and management. And then, how many gamers do we have here? Cool, okay. So how many people know what a, a MOBA is? Okay, cool. So a MOBA, for those who don't know, is a multiplayer online battle arena, and that's what um, League of Legends is. So most people know League of Legends, they just don't know Riot. How many people, when they played games when they were younger, were told by their parents that you know, it wouldn't get them anywhere and it wouldn't get them a job? Right, so I'm one of those people as well, and I kind of proved it wrong. This is Shinobi, anyone remember it? This is one of my most favorite games ever. Um, and this is the second one. And this is probably, in my opinion, the best Mario Kart ever, N64, right? So when Riot approached me, I was working for MongoDB and I was like, oh, it's cool, I'm working with a startup. And then it was like NoSQL database versus game. NoSQL database versus game, and it wasn't really you know, much of a choice. Um, so I was like a kid coming into a candy shop. So what was that candy shop like? So 17 offices worldwide with 2,000 plus rioters. So it's not a big company, but we have a huge geographical spread, right? So like if you think of most companies, they might have 50,000 employees and they might have 20 offices. But the whole thing about gaming is to localize the game, right? We want to reach out to the player. And the best place to do that is to reach to the player as locally as possible. Now. The thing with all these offices is that they all have an internet connection, right? So therefore, they're also a really cool attack vector. Um, and that's one of the big challenges that we have. But what we do in Riot is like we totally emphasize teamwork. We're a sports team, and everyone's autonomous, which brings its own challenges, but enables us to be creative and innovative. So, you know, here's a perfect example of us being innovative and creative, but doing it as a part of a team. You've got a rock dude coming in with low health, red team versus blue team, right? And then literally blue team gets wiped out. That's the type of environment Riot is. You know, one person goes in and then everyone goes in, right? So autonomy is a key component of our success, and it's important that we can all use it effectively to grow, to learn, but it's also important that we do it as part of a team. So what does this teamwork bring, right? It brings pretty impressive stats, but this is all about the player. And we never would have got these stats if it hadn't been about the player. So then the challenge is, as I've joined Riot, is like, how do you, 
how do you work at such a scale and bring security from something that wasn't really at the forefront, wasn't part of our DNA, to become part of that DNA? Right, so in addition to these uh, figures, we have a data warehouse that's like 12 petabytes. You know, we have millions of lines of code, multiple languages. Um, we have servers that, you know, process like billions of events per second, per server. So it's huge. And for me, this was one of the events that brought it home to me. So how many people know where this is? Anyone want to shout? No? Really interactive. Yeah, so this is uh, Seoul in South Korea. So this was the stadium that held the opening match to the World Cup in 2002, right? So you now have this really modern event, which is like five guys playing five guys, and, and naturally they're all Asian, because uh, <laughs> they're much better at games. And there's like 42,000 people watching them, right? Which just blew my mind away. So I travel from Dublin to Seoul to watch an esports event. Like this is something that I never really thought about. But for me, it was incredibly humbling how one game, you know, can do this. And I just was going back to the kid in the candy store, just so lucky to be there. So tying this all together, like we aspire to be the most player-focused games company in the world. Everything is about the player. And you may think that that's just talk, but from the moment I joined, it was literally every single day, like I'd hear it in conversations, right? You know, so it's up to us to use our own creativity and judgment, but always thinking about the player before we implement the solution, right? So if you work in a bank, you can kind of go, hey, you need to do security, or I'm going to talk to your manager, or your manager's manager, right? And you could get a warning or something like that. I can't do that. The team can't do that. We can't approach security in that way. And because we want to be player focused, we also want to understand players and in order to understand players, we have to play games. How many people know games that work out on TCP port 80 and TCP 443, HTTP, HTTPS, like, and that's it? Right. Are there many? No, right? So you can't really say, hey, put a proxy there and it's going to secure everything. It just doesn't really work. And then in addition, you can't, we can't damage that creativity or the ability to move fast. So a good example is, everyone remember this? So because we want to be player focused, we want as many people as possible to play the game, right? And in one area of the world in particular, XP, uh, legal or illegal, is a, a predominant operating system. It's, it's, it's like 12 to 15%. So if you run an XP, you're typically running IE6. If you run an XP, you're out of support. If you run an IE6, you're out of support, so you can't upgrade either. And if you're running that software, you only have SSL v3. You can't upgrade your libraries, right? So we had a choice for one area of the world whereby in order to protect ourselves against uh, Poodle, but more importantly, to protect 80 to 90% of our players in that region, we needed to upgrade against Poodle. But what we would do is we would knock out 10 to 15%, right? So we actually agonized for a long time decide on which one to do. Do we make 80 to 85% vulnerable for no fault of their own? Or do we block 10 to 15% of players from playing the game? Right, so, so that was a really difficult choice for us. And that's what player focus means from a security perspective. OK, so now we move on to a little bit about the security challenges that I faced when we started. So these are our philosophies. Whenever we deploy code, applications, services. So you can see that security is a key philosophy, but it hasn't always been there, right? So our challenge um, is to get it to the forefront of everyone's mind to become part of the DNA that I talked about. And if you look at, if you look at League of Legends as a game, you'll see like a hockey stick graph in terms of the popularity exceeded anyone's expectations, right? And in order to satisfy that popularity and to scale, you know, security isn't necessarily going to be one of the core philosophies. Um, and um, to be honest, it, it was actually quite right. You know, a risk call was made. 
However, what brought us the agility and the ability to scale brought us the wild, wild west of, you know, cloud computing, to be specific, or computing in general. So here's an example that we'll walk through. Everyone's familiar with AWS? Anyone not familiar with AWS? So this kind of turned into like, hey, one day, is everyone familiar with the story where the ops team aren't really moving that fast and the developer wants something out yesterday? So then basically the developer goes and goes, ah, cloud, I'm going to deploy my own shit out there and it's going to work and it's going to be magic. And, and that's kind of what happened. And one team did it, right? And they're like, oh, I need my own account. I need my own VPC. And oh, yeah, because I'm in the cloud, I need to go back to the stuff that I have in my corporate network, right? So I need a VPN connection. That's probably the only secure bit, the fact that it's a VPN. And then another team hears about it, and they're like, cool, I want to get out to the cloud too, because the cloud's awesome. Magic. And then you're like, oh, now I need to stage an account, and now I need a, a test account, right? And then all of a sudden you have 40 VPNs. And then you end up with this. And you're like, holy shit. Right? And, and this is what we call tech debt. And it's probably also self-service, but self-service, not quite correct. So from a maintenance perspective, an administration perspective, an investigation perspective, this is uh, it's quite hard. And I was trying to think, like, how do I actually explain tech debt? And then someone did it really well on the internet for me. As usual, if, if you think you're the first person to have done it, you probably aren't. Does that read well? Everyone remember Tetris and that frustration? It's kind of like what tech debt is. OK, so bringing it a little bit more specific now and talking about some of the challenges that we saw you know, in the last couple of years in Riot. And these challenges kind of prompted us to move in a different direction. Everyone remember Derp Trolling and Lizard Squad? So you think, right, if you, if you play online games or you develop online games, you're, you're doing something fun. Right? It's, it's kind of cool. It's exciting. But unfortunately, excuse me, when you bring online gaming and your main uh, demography is like 15 to 30 year old males and you bring in a competitive, competitive element, you don't really see a lot of maturity. Right? You don't really see unemotional, dispassionate uh, reactions. So if you're playing ranked and you're like, hey, I'm going to improve from level X to level X plus one, and you start losing, and you're, you know, very technical. You know, what's the natural reaction? Well, the natural reaction is to join Lizard Squad and start DDoSing the game that you enjoy. Um, so this wasn't just, you know, symptomatic to, to Riot, to League of Legends. Uh, Valve got hit, uh, PlayStation Network, uh, they got hit, and a bunch of other games, uh, Smite. Um, so. NTP amplification was like the really big one. And it was actually so big, the one that hit us, it was, we thought at the time that it was a 400 gigabits a second. And then we talked to the upstream providers and they were like, hey, it was actually around 600, which is bigger than, you know, what Cloudflare or Arbor or companies like that will, will talk, talk about. Um, but basically it took down most of the Northwest of the US, right? So like that's Portland up to Seattle, like that type of area. Um, so, like, that was a huge community effort, you know, uh, things like BCP38, uh, Bogon filters, uh, bringing in, like, source port blocking. And then, and then you also get things like SYN floods and SSDP amplification. But from a, if you take it back to our mission statement with being player-focused, this is a really crap experience, right? Because what are you going to do when, you know, you're finished your day at work or you're finished school? You just want to play a game with your buddies, but you can't because... Uh, someone's DDoSing you and then tweeting it and then doing this and doing that. And um, those, those were like interesting times, a lot of long nights and stuff. And I don't want to say we've solved it because someone will probably tweet that and then someone will probably DDoS us. So please don't tweet that. Um, so moving on to incident two. So incident two, everyone's familiar with Reddit and the importance of Reddit karma and being like the first person to know something. So this is something that's more of like an internal kind of issue. 
in terms of, um, like every company, before we release stuff, uh, we'll talk about it internally, people will have access to it. And in order to be innovative and creative, we really default to trust, right? So you've gone through a pretty hard hiring process, and if you succeed, then we immediately default to trust you, right? So you can have access to art assets, access to information, and some people make bad judgment calls. And it's all for that like five second of Reddit karma where you get like, you know, plus 96 or things like that. And then you're like, oh cool, I got Reddit karma and I lost my job. Awesome combination. And then finally the third incident. So this is, I guess the first two were like more common over time. And this is one that thankfully wasn't that common, but this happened to me in my third month in Riot and it, it's how I learned to network. So does anyone who plays League of Legends remember this? Okay, anyone feel sorry for me now? This pretty much sucked. And this was, I guess, an incident that formed my opinions on a lot of the things that we needed to do. So we suffered from like lack of visibility um, and really it was like lack of alignment on security and lack of understanding on security. Um, from a lot of people within Riot. So it was quite clear that there was a lot of work to do. But equally, if you think about, about the hockey stick graph and the growth and you know people um, doing amazing stuff, like a lot of the artwork in this presentation is done by some, someone who is very creative, clearly not me, because I can't draw, but you know I can't damage that in innovation if we're going to raise security. So as a result, the actual environment two, two and a half years ago was firefighting, right? And then more firefighting, and then more firefighting again. Like we already did awareness training, but we needed to improve that awareness training to get better alignment. We had tech debt, which was only natural because uh, League of Legends grew faster than anyone ever expected. And our mission statement is like to have a genre defining game Right? It scaled faster than anyone expected, but we had lots of catching up to do from a security perspective. But we still had to remember that everything is about the player. Right? So you gotta remember, why ramp up security if it means that the player can't play the game? And that was something that we had to think about every day. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some of the sections or some of the things that we, uh, that we did in order to ramp security up. Does anyone like Timo who plays the game? Sadistic. So as I was saying, we hire smart people, right? We put them through an extensive interviewing process in order that when they join, we know that they have the basis to succeed and excel. So when I stood back and we talked about it as a team, what we were like, we need to see ourselves as a support organization, right? As a support team. And when people move into leadership, you'll hear them talk a lot about, you know, oh, you need to support your team, right? And that's really what we needed to do as a security team. We needed to support riders in order so that they could succeed, create, innovate, serve the player, but do it in a secure fashion. So we broke that down to three, three elements. One was like to socialize. And by socialize, it's kind of hard because if you think about gamers, they're not exactly the most extroverted, you know, uh, group of people in the world, right? They can't really typically string two words together. They all wear black, might have piercings and they don't see sunlight, right? So that was, a, that was a little bit of a challenge. And whilst socializing, we need to be careful of the message and how we deliver it, right? We need to create alignment. It's not like, hey, you go do this because I said. It's literally like, hey, we think you should do this and here's why. And then eventually come to a solution that maybe 80% of that original solution that you proposed, but 100% alignment. So in in, in Riot, um, we operate a lot of um, Agile methodology. Um, 
We use Scrum quite extensively. Some teams use Kanban. But if you look at Agile, um, we typically have product owners and tech leads, right? So if we want a team to adopt something, we typically have to get the product owner and the tech lead. So the product owner is the person who is like, this is what I want the team to do. The tech lead is like, this is how you will do it, right? So in order to build that alignment, those are the people that you need to work with. And then there's also a role called development manager. Um, I don't know if people, everyone know what a development manager is? It's kind of like a project manager, but like modern day kind of scrum methodology and new title. Um, and that's the person that organizes the work for the team. Right? So those are the type of people that we need to get aligned with where we want to go. Um, and we obviously needed to prove success, prove the tangential benefits, and um, you know, put it into a common language. So take it out of security language and put it into a common language and actually reach out. And that's the important thing is that we weren't doing that before. We weren't reaching out and putting things in a common language. And alignment is, has been absolutely essential to anything we've tried to do. And then final thing is like visibility. So that was a big thing that I noticed from a tech perspective during the instance is that we didn't have the visibility that we wanted to. And it was like, how do I put that visibility into the network, but do it so people can still play games, still be creative and innovative, and I'm not getting abused about being the NSA. So if you talk to Zane Lackey and some of the guys from Etsy, right? They have a phrase, and the phrase is, don't be a dick. So that's the, we couldn't be a dick. If we were going to be dicks, then we'd probably be fired. This is the approach that we took. So for this, I followed the philosophy. If someone else has already done it, you might as well just steal it rather than come up with your own phrase. And um, I couldn't really put it any better. And this is absolutely crucial to anything that we've done. So how do we become you know, aligned? How do we become embraced? So we looked at our awareness training, and we wanted to make it fun, right? We didn't organize pool parties like this, but you know, we talked about making things visual. We talked about how to relate it to being a gamer, constantly thinking of the player, and not taking the traditional security approach that's like, hey, I'm a god. I know everything from security. You got to do it my way, right? We actually went out to finance people, to people who had just started in Riot, to engineers, you know, and we trusted that they know things about their subject matter that we don't know. So we listened to their concerns, but we then put it into their language, right? We do annual training. This is kind of where we do something non-Riot. We actually use compliance for like our own kind of good. Like you have to do annual security training for compliance. Um, I think that's the one benefit of PCI. Trying to think of some others. No, okay. Um, but seriously, we have a really cool compliance team, and, and and we try to make the annual training fun, right? We don't want the annual training being the same this year as it was last year. And how we do this is we take a story approach. So we talk extensively about some of our feelings, um, which if you play the game, you have witnessed. Um, so sorry about that. But they provide really good awareness training, and um, we're constantly taking feedback and we're constantly iterating and changing it. And if you're not really comfortable with feedback, then you're probably in the wrong company. You need a really thick skin. So outside of awareness training and moving that on to AppSec. Hey, it works, Chris. Can everyone see this? It's a little card. It says the definition of secure code, right? So this is a developer, an engineer's kind of work area. <laughs> right. I have a couple of copies of these, so if anyone wants to see them, uh, I can't give them to you, but I can show you them afterwards. This is a definition of secure code. This isn't something that we came up with ourselves. We actually sat down with developers. We're like, hey, what do you want to know? What do you need to know? And we actually iterated through the content. And um, it's proved extraordinarily successful. So this is like version one. And 
we ourselves actually think of this as code. And we're actually going to come out with like version two. And it's going to be version controlled and things like that. But like this has been really awesome. It was a huge success. Um, one other thing from an AppSec perspective that was a, a good success was community of practice. So when you do agile type stuff, we talk about community of practice. So that's like a discipline. So everyone who has the same interest, right? So think of like a network engineer or think of like, I don't know, uh, a Go programmer or something like they might have their own communities of practice. Well, we created an AppSec community of practice across Rahit and we did presentations. And the success was the mailing list. Like the mailing list was phenomenal because we actually saw developers answering all our developers and telling them how to do input validation or output encoding and things like that. But what actually failed was the, the presentations, the actual meet, meetups. And the reason it failed was because it was like preaching to the choir, right? Like the echo, echo chamber. So if you want to learn about AppSec, you're probably already interested in AppSec and then you're going to turn up and we ended up canceling it. And what we do now is we actually go out to their community of practices, right? So we actually go to the web team's community of practice. We go to the Go team's community of practice. We go to the big data team's community of practice. And we present about security. So we embed security in their community of practices rather than doing a security community of practice. Um, one other thing that surprisingly didn't, didn't work for us was we wanted to do AppSec training. So we paid a lot of money for an industry app an industry expert who's also a huge gamer, so it was a great culture fit, and he did training, and we thought it was like awesome. And it turned out that we had like 30, 40% attendance from our engineers. So we were like, hey, what happened? And again, it was the, the whole echo chamber type thing, but it was also the fact that it wasn't a presentation by a rioter, right? You know, we didn't sit down and actually go, hey, engineer X, what do you need to know? And that was like a huge lesson for us. So what we're actually doing now is we're doing our own training. And again, it's all version controlled. And we actually have teams um, helping us with the beta and things like that. So again, it goes back to the outreach. goes back to knowing your audience, listening to what your audience um, actually wants. So another way that we've, we've raised awareness or done outreach is Security Week. So we kind of stole this from Facebook, um, but we probably improved on it. Sorry, Ted. And what we also wanted to do, as well as Security Week, is we wanted to give like a reward to someone who does something that's good from a security aspect, right? So that could be, hey, I got a phishing email. They tell the security team, and then they tell all their team. Or it could be someone who um, discovers a vulnerability in a library, and then commits the code back to the open source library and tells everyone in engineering. And it's absolutely phenomenal how successful this was. Like, people just love t-shirts, especially ones with big uh, monsters and little cute yordles. Um, and this was really, really awesome. And I kind of wish that we realized it earlier, but it was very important to celebrate success. The Security Week was a good challenge. Um, and it, it helped bring security to the engineers and the whole of Riot. But what we didn't realize was how impacting it would be on, on local riders in terms of like it draws them away from you know, contributing to the product or contributing to their solutions. So if you do a security week, just, just bear that in mind. Be cognizant of, hey, there's probably other work that's going on at that time. So within engineering, then more specifically, like how did we how do we move away and create alignment for in terms of like building a secure office, doing red team events, doing incident response, you know, enabling security to monitor your infrastructure? So we actually have a concept called request for comments, which is based on the request for comments of the sorry. Sorry. Um, which is based on the IETF. And, and this has actually been really successful. Um, it's created alignment across engineering, which if you think about it, is 17 offices globally, right? 2,000 riders. So you've got different time zones, different languages, different cultures. And it's, it's been really kind of amazing and humbling to watch. So we'll talk about some examples and how we used an engineering request for comments process to embed security. 
So the first one is red team. I really just wanted to include this image because I think it's kind of cool and reminds me of Rainbow Six. Um, but uh, this is where we actually codify how to do red team exercises. And we've had mi mixed successes with this. Um, this has been really interesting because it's actually shown us how tech debt uh, screws up many years later, right? So our red team is essentially codified. It's based on things like Kali Linux um, and then a whole process for the uh, red team person to follow. And it worked really well on all our new infrastructure that we've built in the last year to two years. But anything built four to five years ago, the process actually just failed. And when we created the RFC and then we modified it and took alignment on it, no one actually spotted this until we actually went to do it. And then it just completely fell apart. Um, so that was really interesting. And for me, it really brought home um, how important it is not to take those shortcuts, right, to deliver that quick-term solution, because it kind of kind of screwed us. And this is like the biggest RFC that we did from a security perspective. So I talked about those 17 offices. So remember that in Raya, the goal is to localize the game, you know, to enhance that player experience, to be player-focused, right? So if you remember the picture of 17 offices, how do you create each one of those secure, right? Because you have a business person, essentially, who wants the office built as quickly as possible so he or she can reach the player, right? And what's one of the impediments in building that office quickly? It's typically security. But for us, it was very important to agree a standard and also to get that visibility and align around the concept of a secure office worldwide. Um, so this document is about 140, 145 lines of pseudocode and it was 850 lines of comments, right? So we started with an RFC, which we were like, hey, this is like 80% security, this will be cool. And it was probably 100% security because us being security professionals are biased totally on security. And the developers and engineers and writers were like, hey, this will stop me doing my job. And, and in the end up, we moved from 100% security, but probably 0% alignment to probably like 80% security and 100% alignment. And that point's really important. It's like, if you don't get 100% alignment, you're not gonna be able to drive security forward. You're not gonna be able to build a security program. So how do we take that pseudocode and make it into code, right? Because we wanna automate, we don't wanna get in the way, remember? So again, JSON, I think someone earlier said JSON's beautiful, it's quite nice. But now, what we can actually do is we can actually go, hey, there's a new engineer. He's in this office. Is the office secure, right? Does it comply with the RFC? And it's like, yeah, it does, cool. He can have access to code. If it's not, then he or she can't have access to code. So I got really excited when we took it to this stage, but again, that's probably slightly nerdy. But uh, it's pretty cool to see the concept of a secure office in a JSON file. Okay, so going back to the original slide, we talked about three different things, socializing, alignment, and then visibility. So we have three types of infrastructure. One is the cloud-based infrastructure, right? Because everyone has to be in the cloud, and it's cool. And then we've got like our, our game infrastructure, and then we've got our corporate infrastructure. And the challenge was how do we get visibility into each of those three infrastructures? Because there's no one tool that, that's gonna provide it all, right? And the challenge with, with game infrastructure, which is more specific to DDoS, but also to like visibility is, um, if you're playing a game and you're not doing very well, if you don't DDoS the server, what you'll probably do is like start writing in chat, lag, 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 like my internet connection's down, you know, as opposed to I'm shit, I'm shit, I can't click quick enough. Because every millisecond counts, right? So every time we put a solution in, we have to think about that. So it's not, it's not actually about adding latency to the service, it's actually about not affecting the service in a consistent manner. So basically when you play an online game, you'll see your ping time, and that could be like 40 milliseconds, right? But if that varies 
then that's a horrible player experience. So again, going back to being player focused and being, and being conscious of player experience, those are the type of things that we have to think of. So typically the uh, philosophy that we follow is the best tool for the job. So these are the type of things that we've used, right? So we will go proprietary whenever we have to. Um, we typically don't like it, but sometimes a proprietary solution is the way to go. We're really big proponents of open source. So Security Monkey, Security Onion, and the AppSec guys regularly have orgasms about this tool. I don't really get it, but apparently it's cool. And then what we also try to do is we, we build our own tools, right? So these are tools that we will eventually open source because giving back to the community is a huge thing for us. And um, it's something that we're very conscious that we need to do. The, the model that we want to follow on that's really the Netflix model. Huge fans of how Netflix go and do things. So this is a screenshot of basically our AWS infrastructure. So you can see that we have just under, take these two figures together. So these are the amount of instances we have running. These are the instances that are stopped. And these, this is a percentage of public IP. So we've obviously got a bit of work to do with our engineers who haven't shut, you know, deleted instances, right? But the benefit of this is we now have visibility. We've now written a tool and shown them, hey, your security posture or your performance posture isn't as good as, as you think it was. This is Python, uh, Flask, MySQL. And then if you remember the RFC stuff that we talked about down here, we have an RFC that actually covers, hey, if you create infrastructure in AWS, you need to tag it, right? Um, is anyone not familiar with tagging in AWS? No? So from an incident response perspective, tagging is really useful because it tells you typically who owns the incidents and what the purpose of the instance is, right? So we now can actually go in, click this button and go, hey, who isn't complying with the RFC? And then uh, give that information. And if you think back to the incident that we had two years ago, we didn't have that visibility. So whilst we're doing all this really cool stuff in AWS and we're writing our own tools or we're using tools that other people have written and released to the world, um, Amazon then decided to release this yesterday. It's kind of pissed me off, but this is like Amazon's version of Security Monkey, Conformity Monkey, and our a little bit of our audit tool. But um, I haven't really played with it yet. But it's something that we'll obviously look at. But it doesn't. I don't think initially it uh, solves our needs. But the point is here: you got to be prepared for uh, something else being released that might be better, right? And it's actually okay to stop development of your own thing if something else is better. Again, going back to the best tool. And then the final bit of visibility is like, we are only a security team of like 15 engineers or so. We can't see everything. So we, we come up with our own bug bounty program. And this was private. And initially, it was really successful. Primarily, at the start, it was uh, game bugs. So by that, we mean bugs that, hey, if I do this combination of keys, then I can spam all the spells and I don't lose mana or I don't get charged for it essentially, right? And then last November, we did like a, a public beta, so to speak. And it's been very successful. At the start, it was a huge impact. And the lesson there was the failing was that we probably released it before we were ready. So the workload hit us really hard. If you worked on the AppSec team, like 70% of your sprint was doing bug bounty. Right, so that's now down to 15%, which is through uh, weekly bug bounty meetings, creating our own tools, and um, trying to automate as much as possible. The, the key thing with bug bounty as well, before I show you the tool, is that you have to be grateful, right? Always be grateful to the researcher, because they've taken the time to find a vulnerability, explain it to you. And then to take that to the next level is sometimes the researcher doesn't struggle technically, but it's just struggling with communication, right? Or maturity, or even language. So take the time to work with the researcher. And if you do this, you can actually move someone who's a researcher from like low to mid level up to like your top five, right? Your top 10%. Like we have seen that. 
and we've talked to other companies around Bug Bunny, and they've seen that as well. Right? So just always bear, bear in mind the researcher. And this is the tool. I don't know how well this comes up, but literally another Flask, Python, and for some reason our intern decided to write this in Maria database. But uh, sure, it works. And this was an intern project over the summer. And literally what this does is with our bug bunny, we work with Hacker One. So Hacker One are um, up there with Bug Crowd and Synac is like the top three bug bunny companies. But what we were struggling with was like, how do we present the bug bounty data to be meaningful to the engineers, right? To actually take into things like risk. How do we do a better job of uh, projecting it? How do we do a better job of tracking it? And again, we fell back to we need to develop our own tool to link in HackerOne information with Jira, right? Because we use Jira for incident problem management tracking of issues. So once we did that, we saw like huge increase in involvement and contribution from developers. Okay, so you're glad to know this is the final section. Right, so we've done all that work, so you could kind of go, hey, we're finished, we're at the final boss. But really, we just see this as the beginning. Like we've improved a lot, but we have a lot more to do. The biggest challenge for me is like, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, as several people on the team are. And there's a few people smiling, so I guess they know that's true. And I'm a completer finisher, right? I like to do everything. I like to complete it. But you have to bear in mind, if you're going to make huge changes to your security DNA, and you're going to raise that bar, you got to let some things go, right? You can't do all the things. But you need to be there to meet the challenge, continue to rise to it, and more importantly, support your team or your colleagues in um, raising security. So the type of features that we're kind of looking at and working on is hiring. Hiring is impossible. It's really hard. And it takes up far too much of my time sometimes. But the feeling when you get that one hire that's absolutely awesome is amazing. Because you hear a lot of people in engineering talking about a 10Xer, right? 10Xer is probably an exaggeration. But when you get someone that can you know, be autonomous, go off and knock shit out, and you don't have to worry about them, like that's phenomenal. They raise the bar more than anyone else. Those are the type of people that you need to pay too much, right? They should never be leaving because of money. They should always be looked after, you know. So hiring, massively important. Um, standards and verify. So that's touching on things like the RFCs, touching on things like the awareness training, right? but then verify that those things have been happening. So things like red team testing, we need to get better at. We still want to do, but we need to do it differently than typically it's been done in the industry. We need to create tools, but we need to be conscious of those tools being best of breed, right? Sometimes proprietary is the right way to do it. And then most importantly is like outreach. If you don't do outreach, you're not going to raise the security program, right? You're not going to improve it. And the most important things that we've done is we've tried to talk in the language of the developers, tried to talk in the language of the other riders. Um, we have gone and visited other companies. Uh, we've gone to Silicon Valley, talked to people who've solved a lot of the problems that we've tried to solve. Um, we're trying to build you know, a security brand and we're coming to conferences like this. We are constantly seeing ourselves as a support organization. And if we, don't, if we don't talk about our challenges or how we've solved them, then we will never actually improve, right? We'll never learn. So I can't really, I guess, overemphasize you know, the importance of outreach. We want to ensure that security is in our DNA and in our products. So taking it back to the previous slide where I talked about hiring, one of the things that we did was um, we actually created an infrastructure in AWS because what we've noticed with hiring is that we typically have, we, we often have like a challenge in terms of differentiating between uh, book knowledge and practical knowledge, right? 
So we built an infrastructure so we could test people. This is an example of success, but it's also a failure, right? Because we've been able to build the infrastructure, we just haven't turned it into something useful. So this is a very real example of how we're trying to think about hiring in a slightly different way and to um, ensure that we get better hires and also provide a better hiring, ex hiring experience to candidates. And where we did this was a thing called Thunderdome. Has anyone heard of Thunderdome? One person? Two? Cool. Thanks for listening. So Thunderdome is like our own internal hackathon, which we do twice a year. And this is literally where engineers, artists, finance people, anyone can like come along and spend like three days. It was originally one day and it was 24 hours, but what happened was people weren't actually sleeping for about 36. So then productivity was like damaged for a week. So what we tried to do is split it out over three days and do, you know, I guess smaller slots so that people get uh, rest. Um, you can learn more about this if you go on to thunderdome.riotgames.com. We have a seven minute video um, about our culture, about what we do. And um, I wanted to include it in this, but I didn't have time, but it's really cool and I recommend checking it out. So yeah, just, just to bring it home, like you don't want to run to stay still. And if you think about it earlier, we were doing a lot of firefighting. We were doing a lot of work and we we're doing a lot of good work, but we weren't actually progressing, right? So you want to become part of the organization, not separate. So a really good book that talks about this is The Phoenix Project, right? Where it talks about not operating in isolation and always being there to support. And that was key to us. So just in case you misheard, I talked about reaching out, right? It's really important. You gotta be versatile and adapt to the situation. And for us, one of the things that we're actually now gonna do is we're going to change how we are structured as an organization, right? Has anyone ever done like stakeholder mapping as a security team? Like actually sat down and gone, who are my stakeholders? So the question then that I would have is like, how do you actually know if you're delivering what you should be delivering, right? So we've actually sat down and said, these are our stakeholders. These are the ones that have power. These are the ones that we want to influence, right? These are the ones that we need to work really closely with. These are the ones that we just need to, you know, check in with every few months, right? So if you don't know how your stakeholders are, how can you engage? How can you align? How can you actually support your organization, right? And once you do those things, then you can actually learn, hey, we were like way off, we need to iterate. Or hey, we were doing a good job, we need to iterate just a little bit, right? So remembering your audience is massively important. And one of the things that we're doing now is we're actually restructuring our team. So we have two kind of audiences, so to speak, one being player, one being rider, right? And like most security teams, we were kind of organized alongside disciplines. So think of like AppSec, like network security, system security, right? So the problem there is that they have multiple audiences, right? They don't just have one thing. So you're trying to fix system problems for people who are on the corporate side or people who are on the player side. And as a result, you're not really delivering the product, security being the product, that you need to deliver, right? So what we're doing is we're gonna split and one side of the team is gonna be focused on players, the other is gonna be focused on rider. And I think that's gonna help us a lot. And that's a perfect example of iteration and also being prepared to fail, right? If you're not prepared to fail, how are you ever gonna learn? So yeah, key point, alignment, remember your audience and uh, you're there to support, not the other way around. And that is it. I really appreciate your emphasis on the importance of hiring, and I, I like the approach with uh, kind of your, the 
Yeah, you didn't go too deep into kind of your technical screening, but it looks pretty solid. In terms of getting that, say, not 10x or but whatever, like star kind of person that you want. To me, you're not only kind of trying to filter for technical skills, but also for character, something that's more ephemeral, like is the person a self-starter? Um, what's their work ethic? What's their personality? I, I, do you have, can you say something to how you screen for that kind of, those kind of qualities? Yeah, I guess I try to hire people I don't have to manage, because if I have to manage them, then you know, it's not gonna help me or help the team ramp. Um, so a lot of the questions that we ask are open-ended questions. And I don't expect people to get 100% when they do the first screen. Um, like we can do 13, 14 interviews. So those type of things pretty much uh, come through. So we'll do like a couple of phone screens. And then what we want to do is we'll do, want to do a practical screen, but we haven't hit that bar yet. Uh, excuse me, before they come on site. And then the on-site's typically like six or seven hours. And people focus on competencies. So things like collaboration, things like communication. Um, there'll be like two interviews, there'll be like subject matter ex expert. And then there'll be one like culture values. Um, and people can go outside their competency, but they're encouraged not to. Um, we do interview training, which helps people screen for those competencies. Uh, the questions that I ask are typically open-ended questions. And Again, not 100%, so what we often do is like, we will engage with people who are following up and going, hey, he or she didn't get this thing right. Are they a bit shaky on this? How did they do on it? In terms of like, you know, the subsequent interview, be it two weeks later, you know, screen for that, right? Or screen for that on the on-site after the phone screen. And, and that's kind of like self-starter. Um, look for things like, did you contribute to open source, you know, communities? Um, what have you done to learn about the game, the product? Like, some people have actually turned up and presented a security report on how insecure our network and protocol was, or like things that we did, right? So it's like, do people do things that are above and beyond that I haven't asked them to do? Um, do they, if they're not a gamer, or maybe they're a lapsed gamer, have they tried to play the game? What have they learned about the game? Um, and then in the earlier interviews, like, if they don't know much about the game, encourage them to learn, and then in a subsequent interview, like check for those type of things. But it's one of those things that's quite hard to, you know, drill into. Similarly, like ethics is another thing, but for ethics, it's massively important to us more than any other team probably. Um, and how, how I do that is like, I'll ask them something that they probably won't know and see if they lie. And if they lie, then it's, not really a good sign of ethics, or you know, um, but yeah, it's there's no real science to interview. Like it's it's really more of an art, and it's also about establishing very strong interviewers, so people who you can trust and who you know can ask the right things. But like, what have they done in the open source community? What do they know about Riot? What like presentations did they go out and learn? Like, did they go onto Game Developer Vault and go, hey? I want to know about X or I want to know about Y. And then what type of questions do they ask? So like, I know one guy that like, walks in the interview and he's like, okay, so this interview is going to be 60 minutes of you asking me questions and don't ask me any stupid questions. And it literally goes, okay, try again, try again, try again. And then if, they, <laughs> if the person doesn't really ask any questions, then right. Um, so different people have different techniques, but we put a strong panel together as well and ensure that we communicate. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it did pretty well. Uh, just when you talk about having, like trying to put together a strong panel, do you track metrics for interviewers? Like this person interviewed these people and over time their outcomes were X, Y, and Z? Because it seems like that could take it to the next level. Yeah, if, if you read uh, Laszlo Bach's book on work rules for Google, they, they do something similar to that. We haven't got to that level, um, but we do note people's feedback, um, how people are thumbs up, why they're thumbs up, and then sooner or later you might find yourself off a panel, right? So it's like, hey, thumbs up, uh, this person's brilliant, and that's it. Then you might get another chance, but then you're probably off the panel if you don't actually provide feedback. Like, um, 
one of the key facets of Riot is feedback, and that works to both ways. And if you're not providing feedback, then you're not adding value. So you'll get coaching and feedback yourself on how to improve that. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's not as much of a science as it is at Google, but it's probably getting, it's probably gonna go that way. Thank you. No problem. Nice to reach you. Just give me a second. There you go. So you, you've been doing this process now for a couple of years. So if you could go back to the beginning, what, what would be the two or three things that you'd do from the very beginning to do it differently and make it easier on yourself? Um, damn. <laughs> I think um, <laughs> I would probably... Try and I think uh, I think I do. I try to get the alignment earlier than I I kind of realized. Um, I think now, like when I look at how I do an RFC versus then, it's it's already tapered down. So what I what I didn't do then was I didn't reach out as much. Um, so I definitely try and reach out more, build um, key relationships earlier. That makes sense, um, which would help me learn about the challenges that each team has, um, but also the, the, the people who could help me influence in order to get things moving. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, I think one thing I'd do is I'd probably be less afraid of standing up and uh, making my point. So. I have a tendency to shoot from the hip, as you may or may not know. But I need to be more forceful, if that makes sense. So I think I need to be more forceful, but doing it in a more constructive fashion. And I now have realized that, but I wish I realized that two years ago. Because sometimes there comes a point that whilst you want alignment and you want to keep the creativity and innovation, you have to be prepared to call bullshit. And then, the other thing I wish I had done sooner, which I only did last week, was we got a really cool uh, vulnerability in her bug bunny program the week before last. So I'm like sitting watching Wales v England. I'm being Irish, I'm like delighted, right? Because Wales score a try, you know, 10 minutes to go. Um, and I'm getting excited and then my phone goes and it was like on call. I was like, shit. And then I started getting texts from my, my DM so you probably uh, want to like, you know, get online really soon. And I checked the vulnerability and I was like, shit. And I was able to track down to the very second, 10 months ago, um, when the vulnerability started, right? So what I wish I had done was like built those visibility tools earlier and, and, and done it in a forceful fashion. But more importantly, after we fixed the issue, and closed it off. I actually wrote up the incident report, and yesterday I published it on our local intranet for everyone in the company to actually view. And I wish I did that before yesterday, because the key thing for me when I talk a lot about visibility is you automatically think about visibility into the infrastructure, right? So to get alignment, I had a lot of one-on-ones, and I go to LA and I talk to people and things like that, and do that influencing. But what I realized is that we as a security community, our security team didn't actually communicate how bad some shit was, right? So the password database loss, I was meeting people who were responsible for developing our store, right? So everyone knows that our store's in PHP. <laughs> so you'd kind of think that they would be an important people to like reach out from an AppSec perspective and go, hey, here's an example of shit gone wrong and gone really bad, password database gone. But that actually didn't happen. So we as a security team were failing on the communication of actually providing some realistic descriptions of like what can happen when crap goes wrong. So that would be the, that'd be the key point. I wish I did the IR report and publicized it sooner. Um, I have a question. So um, how do you manage your code security? 
Like, do you use automated tools or do you require peer reviews before code is pushed um, into your repository? How does it work? Um, so we use a couple of different repositories, typically, you know, the ones that are most popular. And um, what we'll do is the, the code has to be pushed by an engineer, but it also has to be, sorry, where is the questioner? OK. It's like, um, it has to be you know, approved by someone going in. There's ultimately an owner, a product owner, of, of our source code, so League of Legends source code. And then there's like different branches. And this is all done through RFC as well. We actually have an RFC on code ownership. And that essentially means that someone is ultimately the owner of every single line of code, right? So it's that owner that's responsible for that being committed, so to speak. And it's, it's done through typical you know, products that you can probably guess. But what we've done from an AppSec perspective is uh, we've written checklists, we've written the, sec um, the secure code card and things like that. And we are actively encouraging teams to reach out and, and do you know, secure code and, and get their stuff you know, broken and tested and things like that. And one of the big benefits in order to, to be able to do that is we took the decision to actually visit local offices so if you remember the slide with like 17 offices, each one of those offices can potentially uh, write code, push it to a repo, and then that code goes to a player or whatever. So we had like one office that was like, you know, we were finding servers like in random German hosting companies and stuff like that that had port 3389 open, uh, had Microsoft SQL open, had like 445, uh, 139, and 135 and stuff like that. And you're like, what the? And now that team has actually gone the other way, and all their reports are like minor vulnerabilities. And we actually found that it wasn't so much through like checking stuff being committed, but actually going out to their office, spending time with them, explaining things to them. And they're pretty smart, and typically they're smarter than us and the actual subject matter expert, and then letting them own the actual decision. And then they have their own process internally in that engineering team terms of how code is pushed, committed, verified, and things like that. Um, they did try uh, Coverity, but it, but it didn't, it didn't really um, work. It's not really due to the product as such, but it was more due to how the teams worked. And then what we've done as well is um, we're actually writing extensions to things like Burp and, and committing that back to the community and then sharing that locally within uh, various engineering teams and blogging about it and stuff. Does that make sense? Uh, hi. Just kind of following on what you were saying about communicating. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> with the, with the non-security focused teams, what sort of effect would you say the instance had with them? Did it kind of make them sit up and go, right, we need to fix this, we want to be involved, we want to engage with the security teams, or was it kind of largely ignored? Which one was that? Um, just any of the, the instance you outlined during the talk, particularly um, say the database breach. Well, the thing with like the leaks and the Reddit karma is that that typically hurts hurts the team because they've worked very long, you know, on something that's like typically kept under wraps. So that type of effect definitely encourages encourages them to reach out. Um, whenever we blog about stuff. People totally reach out. Um, the password database one, I thought more teams would have reached out, but that's where we sucked in terms of communicating. We didn't actually make people realize how bad the effect was. Um, the awareness training is really good because we just get like people going, hey, I got fished, or I got this, or I got that, and that happens all the time. We've actually had red team exercises fail because people like walk up to our desk and go, I think this is a phishing email. Um, which is awesome. That means our awareness is working. So phishing is like people are inherently paranoid. Um, we've had like some really awesome phishing attacks come in, and we've done really well from the awareness training from that. Um, so that kind of seems to stick with people. Um, the DDoS one is interesting because people will be on communities, you know, like because we're all gamers, so they're on like gamer forums and things like that. Or they might be playing a game and like, again, going back to that immaturity, it's like, hey, 
uh, I'm going to fucking DDoS you because I'm like 17 and I have nothing better to do or shit like that. And we get screenshots of those and we get a, like a lot of those escalated. DDoS is interesting because like, it's really easy to DDoS stuff. It's just really hard to protect it. Um, but like the awareness program has been really successful and whenever we, we actually actively reach out and try to put things in non-security language, it, it definitely encourages others to reach out. So one of the things that we've started doing as well is um, like vendor certification. And um, that's literally because anyone in Riot can install whatever they want to be innovative, creative, move fast, all that stuff. So we actually blogged about the vendor certification and things like that. And we've actually found that people are now reaching out to us because of it. And again, it goes back to blogging, documentation, making it visible, easily searchable. Okay, so I'm aware that uh, lunch is coming up now, so, uh, and I, but there are still a lot of questions going on, so I would uh, just say already give Mark a round of applause. Thanks. So I'm, I'm inclined to continue with the question round. However, the people that want to go for dinner, you can leave, but please try to do it quietly. Hi, I've just got a small question from a friend who couldn't make it today, but who is your favorite Riot InfoSec uh, employee or, or person? <laughs> I don't have any favorites. Okay, I have uh, one other question though. Um, so you exampled the DDoS attacks, so yeah, so some months ago the drop hack was really popular. Are you still seeing a lot of instances of this type of program, or is there a clear decline? And what are the countermeasures? Is the is the camera is the recording off now? No, not yet. Never off. Not yet. If the recording is off, I can talk about this. Now let's talk about the drop pack and stuff offline. But for DDoS, if you think about when you're playing a game, right, latency is really important. But I touched upon the jitter effect. So if you think about DDoS services like Prolexic, Arbor Cloud, um, the VeriSign stuff, it's really easy to go, hey, I'm going to put this in front of my website. But a game is in the brochure site. It's not like you know a gambling site or something. It's over HTTP, HTTPS. Um, and, and you can't use any cast, right? Because you need to be close to the servers. So the thing with DDoS is you just need a shit ton of capacity and you need money. And if you're like Facebook, Google, Amazon, like that'll work. So if you actually, um, if you Google, I think, NA, NA server roadmap, you'll see some of the stuff that we've done. Um, not specifically to to like stop DDoS, but to stop DDoS, but also to get closer to the player, right? To enhance that player experience. So if everyone's familiar with Netflix and how they actually rank ISPs, has anyone seen that? No? But like Netflix rank ISPs, right? You can go to a page on Netflix and says, these are the best ISPs for watching Netflix. What we've done is we've essentially built our own pop infrastructure. So we're going closer to the player which means that we don't have transit providers in our way. You know, so you'll go from your local ISP and then boom, that ISP could be peering with Riot or it could be like ISP, one transit provider, peer directly to Riot, right? So in, in, North, in, in Europe, it's our game servers for EU West are in, are in Amsterdam. EU, EU Nordic is basically Frankfurt and Amsterdam, right? But then we've also created POPs, so points of presence. So it's going to be like London, Vienna, possibly Stockholm, uh, Milan, Madrid, Paris, right? So if you're in those countries, you will see a, a quicker response. But the benefit of that is that you're bailed on a distributed network, which means you're able to distribute the DDoS attack. So two things that you need, a few things. You need a really good team of techies, you need people that are going to work really hard, 
you need to be able to like build relationships with the various providers. And then you need money. Money helps. Um, but it's not just about money and it's not just about preventing DDoS. It's about building like that kind of huge infrastructure, which is like our version of any cast. Like when we were getting the 400 gig NTP amplification tax, I talked to some really well-known internet companies and they were like, oh yeah, we saw it as well, but we basically swallowed it. And I was like, shit, 400 gigs? They're like, yeah, it's like a blip, you know, like a bump in the wire. Like, wow. And I was like, okay, need to get bigger. Need to get more distributed. Because ACLs, like source port blocking, destination port blocking, Bogon filters, or like GOIP blocking are only going to go so far. And the thing about GOIP blocking as well is that you don't want to damage that player experience either, right? So depending on how homogenous your region is, you can only do so much of that. You can't just block China because most of it actually doesn't come from China. And China is huge into games. So does that answer the question? I can talk about the drop hacking later over dinner if you buy. To um, coming back to the point of presence uh, distributed around, um, were you ever approached by network providers trying to force you into, um, let's no. say, making agreements towards a better quality of service uh, well, agreement? Like, like the Netflix and Comcast deal? Yeah. No. Okay, so, so, the, uh, so it's not like, well, with, with Netflix, they're more or less trying to, to sell bandwidth. Do they sell latency as well in that model? I don't think most providers would actually know how to uh, control latency for a gamer. I don't, I don't think they can really relate. Um, but I haven't come across it. Some of our network engineers may have, but um, I, I haven't. We talk a lot about the project that's called Riot Direct. Um, so if you Google it, like you can find more information um, about it. But um, yeah, we haven't come across it at all. Thank you. No problem. Any questions? So you stated that you use Security Onion. Do you uh, really do full packet capture for all the players and also your office locations? or? Um, we don't use Security Onion um, for game infrastructure. Um, Security Onion's not going to scale <laughs> <laughs> to do 40 gig a second or something like that. But um, we do do full packet capture some parts of our network in our game infrastructure. And um, like the, the full packet capture stuff is the secure office RFC. So the offices that we've rolled that out to do have FPC. But uh, yeah. How long do you store? Big as the disk is, it's it's inconsistent across, it's inconsistent across different infrastructures. Like, what we usually try to do is like, uh, like three days, um, and then after that, it's more so the metadata, right? As opposed to, um, but like the whole presentation, it's not like, hey, I'm finished. Like, here's the end of your report. It's kind of like, hey, <laughs> this is like the midterm report and these are the things that we've done and like our goal is to you know automate ourselves out of a job but realistically we're never going to do that with security so the approach that we've taken is like try to build security into the dna and make everyone aware of it and and help um you know touching on like hiring and things like that we're never going to have a security team that can do everything for us A uh, question about uh, whether or not you get involved in the design phase for uh, securing games and, and the feature sets within the games. Is that something that you, you do typically? Sorry, the... So security by design, and, as in like logic flaws in the game uh, that would allow people to take advantage of the game that are much harder to rip out later down the line. 
Um, like that's again. So now it would all go through the RFC process, right? So it would be visible. So anything that you're going to change or fundamentally from a service or solution or application aspect, it would all be through the RFC. So that's like wide open. And we are responsible ourselves for ensuring that we keep up to date with the RFC. Now, if something happens and we haven't contributed, someone will typically ping us, right? Um, but we also need to understand that like the game is written in C++. I don't really know C++. I can do like hello world and that's about it. Like our AppSec guys kind of know C++, but they don't know it to the degree of the SME, if that makes sense. Um, we also have like 70 million players, right? And a lot of them are technical. So if you think about like 10 people that you meet in the world, like usually one of them is a douchebag, right? So we have probably 7 million douchebags who are technical and they're constantly like, you know, pinging, trying to like go, I'm, I want to break this or, you know, I want to do better for a competitive advantage and things like that. Um, but yeah, like we actively have people reaching out to us. But when it comes down to like the pure logic, then that's like really a gameplay, you know, engineer. And it's you're never going to have that level of SME that they're going to have. So really, again, you can only support to a certain degree.